Hey, it's me. Welcome to my channel and I thank you so, so much for tuning in, okay? Now, I'm going to continue reading from Matthew today. I've just got back from Blidworth Woods. It's a great place to go cycling and to go walking as well. Anyway, um, yeah, I reached the end of Matthew 17. The last time I did a Matthew video, this will be either Matthew... I read out of Matthew part 6 or part 7. I think it's going to be part 6. But don't quote me on that because I haven't checked on it. But we are at Matthew 17, 14, the healing of a boy with a demon. Now, I will be adding my own input into it as per usual, but not too much because I don't want to make this video drag on for too long, okay? And I'll be reading from Matthew 17, 14 all the way. Oh, I can't believe I took this out. <laughs> all the way to... Matthew 20, the start of Matthew 20, okay? Right, so here goes, and once again, thank you so, so much for tuning in, and remember to like and subscribe, and definitely check out my other videos, and tell other people who you think might be interested in my channel, okay? Because it means a lot to me, because I only have a small YouTube channel, right? Anyway, Matthew 17, 14, the healing of a boy with a demon, right? When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. Now, let's not forget that demons are the spirits of the Nephilim, which were around before Noah's flood and after Noah's flood as well. And demons can cause all sorts of things that are wrong with us mentally, physically, emotionally. Obviously, not everyone who is sick or unwell or ill in some way or has some sort of disease, not all of them has had it caused by a demon, but some people have, some people haven't. But there are a large minority of people on this earth that are being attacked by demons right now, okay? I know that in this modern so-called scientifically enlightened age of ours, this secular world we're living in, it seems like uh, it seems like a bit of a medieval thing to say, talking about demons. A lot of people laugh about that sort of thing as if it's just fiction, but it's not, trust me. Because I had one visit me when I was only 10 years of age, okay? <laughs> and if you want to watch that video, then feel free to do so. You, you might have to go back two or three pages on my YouTube channel, but it's there, okay? It's one of the earlier videos that I've started on this channel, okay? I think it's called... I experienced the supernatural at 10 years of age, or something like that, anyway. Anyway, let me, uh, yeah, yeah, let me start from the beginning. Right, Matthew 17, 14, the healing of a boy with a demon. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. O oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up, how long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed from that moment. Now, let's not forget that these fallen angels and demons have souls. They have spirits just like the way we do. OK, the only difference is that God has rejected them because they rebelled against him. OK. <laughs> so just bear that in mind and then it says here then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked why couldn't we drive it out he replied because you have so little faith I tell you the truth if you have faith as small as a mustard seed you can say to this mountain move from here to there and it will move nothing will be impossible for you when they came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life, and the disciples were filled with grief. Okay. And also that's a very, very important thing he said about faith, because some Christians have more faith than others. Oftentimes in my life I've lacked faith, especially when it comes to my loneliness and my depression and all the rest of it, but... I've got no choice but to trust in God at the end of the day. Anyway, uh, now we're on to Matthew 17, 24, the temple tax. And that leads us on to Matthew 18. 
After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon, he asked, from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes, from their own sons or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the sons are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not offend them, go to the lake and throw out your line, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. So that's just a little display of his supernatural power. We're talking about the Son of God here, OK? <laughs> yeah, because it says here, Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Brilliant. <laughs> Matthew 18, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had, and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that just goes to show you how important humility is. Regardless of how, how high our IQ is, how many university qualifications we have, how, how much we get paid for what we do for a living or whatever. You know, it's always about humility. That's what it's about. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. So that just goes to show you how seriously God takes any sin of, at all that are done against little children. And yeah, that does include, you know, what you think it does. It begins with P, okay? But there's other sins that can be done against children as well. And God takes it all incredibly seriously, all right? That's why it says here, but if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It could be leading a child into sin. It could be leading a child into sexual immorality. It could be anything at all. It would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned into the depths of the sea. And this also refers to child abuse, verbal abuse, that kind of thing. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. Yeah? If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. That just goes to show you that after we die, and I hate to break it to you folks, but we're all growing older and we're all going to die sooner or later, whether we like it or not. And because we're eternal beings, we're either going to be eternally with God or eternally not with God. And God knows those who love him and those who have potential and those who are going to end up being saved and those who are. It's as simple as that. It may seem a bit black and white, but that's how it is. In fact, a lot of people try and escape that by saying all oh, this purgatory in hell and they say things like, uh, oh, um, I'm a Christian, but I believe in reincarnation as if to say we've got a chance after chance after chance to redeem ourselves in one life after another. But it doesn't work out like that. OK, we just get one very short life here. And then that's it. We get judged. It's the judgment seat of Christ. But believe me, God is perfectly fair. His judgments seem harsh to a worldly and atheistic uh, mind and heart, OK, to, to, to an ungodly mind and heart, a heart that is far removed from God's. But God, don't forget, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. As far as the stars are above us, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, OK? So just bear that in mind. He knows who belong to him and those who don't. Anyway, let me just read that part again. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. That's how serious it is. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Okay? <laughs> yeah? 
Anyway, now we're on to Matthew 18.10, the parable of the lost sheep. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your father, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. Okay. Now we're on to a brother who sins against you. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. So just between the two of you, if he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, he's saying treat them like you would a pagan by, by, by an um... Sorry, I'm getting mixed up. <laughs> anyway, let me read that again. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would an unbeliever. He actually says pagan, but the word pagan means an unbeliever, okay? Or a tax collector. <laughs> he didn't mince his words, okay? So in other words, that person was never a Christian to begin with. If someone refuses to be corrected, if someone despises instruction and discipline and doesn't like to be shown his faults, that person was never a Christian to start off with. Or at the very least, they're spiritually very, very immature and they need to go back to the drawing board, to say the least. And then it goes on to say, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. This is talking about spiritual warfare a little bit here. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what we say, what we do, what we pray, what we don't pray, what we do and what we don't do, everything has an effect on what, on what not only happens in the first heaven where we are, this physical realm that we can hear, see and touch, but it also has an effect in the second heaven. And also it has an effect in the third heaven where God acts and commands, okay? So everything we say and do has an effect on what's going on around us in the spirit realm and everything. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. That just goes to show you how powerful uh, our relationship with God is. We have great authority in the name of Jesus. Never forget that. Whoever's watching this video right now, I pray that your faith increases in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to such an extent that even if Satan himself with his ugly appearance that God has given him now, appears in front of you. Even if Lucifer himself appears in front of you, as frightening as he is, if you speak the name of Jesus, even though your knees may buckle, even though you may fall flat on your face, okay, speak the name of Jesus and he will depart from you. And that's even if he appears to you face to face, which he very, very rarely does that. And it's just something I'd like to say about Lucifer. Now, he was created incredibly beautiful, obviously, and uh, majestic. But God has given him an ugly appearance and he can appear beautiful. He can appear handsome. He can appear like the way he was before he fell from grace. He still has that wisdom and knowledge and understanding that God gave him. OK, he's quite possibly the wisest and most knowledgeable being ever created, second to Jesus Christ, of course. And, um, of course, he's fallen now. He's a criminal on the run. But he's basically psychotic. He's desperate. He's got nothing to lose. And he's just out to destroy as many people as possible. Whether it's through murder, rape, paedophilia, pornography, simply being an atheist all life long, and then you die, you get thrown into hell or whatever. He will stop at nothing to kill you. He can kill your body, but he can't kill your soul. Only God can do that. So just stick with Jesus. Hang on to Jesus Christ for dear life, whatever you do, OK? <laughs> just a special message I like to put out there. Anyway, I hope I haven't lost where I am. Yeah, so... 
Anyway, now we're on to Matthew eighteen twenty one, the parable of the unmerciful servant. Okay. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. He meant indefinitely. Okay. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Right. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants, he owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. OK, so it's about forgiving other people, not holding grudges. And believe me, I know how hard that is because there's been times in my life up until recently, actually, where I felt bitterness. I felt envy. I felt jealousy. I, th I felt, you know, like, like, like I've had it in for people sometimes. But I know that's the wrong attitude to have. Anyway, now we're on to Matthew 19, Divorce. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees, not Pharisees, Pharisees, came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? So, so they were testing his knowledge here. They were trying to trip him up. They were always trying to trip Jesus up, the so-called masters of the Judaic law and tradition. <laughs> Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Now, let me read that out again. I know that having sex outside of marriage has become the norm, but as far as God's concerned, his original plan, don't think we're talking about 13 to 15,000 years ago here when he created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. And of course, before then were the civilizations of God's angels and it gets really, really complicated, okay? There's a lot of history to this earth that we don't even know about, man. Anyway, it was about 13 to 15,000 years ago, approximately, when Adam and Eve were created. And it would have been a spectacular sight. It would have been nothing simple about it. OK, it would have been incredible. Of course, this earth is millions of years old, but that's besides the point. OK, anyway, listen to me. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. So he created man and woman. So in other words, relationships are supposed to be between a man and a woman. And again, that sounds very old fashioned too these days. But don't forget, we're talking about thousands upon thousands of years ago where, you, you know, Adam and Eve were created perfect. There was no physical imperfections, no mental imperfections, no emotional imperfections, no learning difficulties, no personality disorders. Um... People were sexually purer and more straightforward. There was less corruption on every level, okay? And it says here, But at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. So in other words, they should get married first and the two will become one flesh. That means they should have sex, okay? Okay. <laughs> 
so they are no so they are no longer two but one therefore what god has joined together let no man separate that so he takes it very very seriously okay god created sex he created relationships but don't forget about the more sex we have especially outside of marriage and at a really early age let's say from the age of 16 which is rather typical these days um the more partners we have it's like it's like we're devaluing the currency of sex. In other words, we're cheapening the act of sex. In God's eyes, sex is something that's fantastic. It's wonderful. But he has his own ideas of what sex should be about. And the world has its ideas, okay? There's a difference. And there's a price to pay. Yeah, sexual immorality feels fantastic at the time, okay? But it has consequences. It has a long-reaching consequence in our hearts, our minds. It affects our relationship with God. So don't be deceived by the ways of this world. Turn to the Bible and figure out what God wants you to do. Now, a lot of Christians, including myself, I'm, I mean, I've often thought to myself, how is it even possible not to have sex outside of marriage? I mean, in my case, I've never found the right person for me. That's why I'm still a virgin, OK? I know that's a bit of a personal detail, but what the heck? It's my channel. I can say what I want. OK, I'll be 34 on the 30th of April and you best believe that I felt a lot of loneliness and a lot of depression in my life and a lot of hopelessness. I felt like uh, sometimes I thought to myself, is God ever going to find me anyone? But that, they're, they're just my personal circumstances, but I'm just telling you what's written in the Bible. It's as simple as that, OK? Anyway, so they are no longer two but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate you. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man gives his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. You see what I was talking about earlier on? From the beginning, <laughs> things were entirely different. People's hearts weren't hard or wax cold like they are today. And don't forget, the more sex we have with more different people, a part of our soul gets intertwined with theirs you know uh, sexual intercourse is such a beautiful thing but it, but but when we do it with the wrong person at the wrong time especially if it's with an unbeliever um it, it has consequences there have been people that have been known to get together with someone who have never suffered from depression once in their whole lives then the moment they have sex with this particular woman or or in a woman's case with a particular man they start suffering from depression because there are spiritual consequences to what we do. You know, whatever demons and whatever spiritual warfare was going on in that person's life who you've had sex with, that gives them in the second heaven permission to torment you. That's how serious it is, man. But when we have intercourse of somebody else, OK, it affects us on so many different levels. And that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult for people to split up from each other, even when they've had abusive relationships, verbally abusive, physically abusive, because sexual intercourse has this thing where it sort of welds people together, okay? And that's why so many women refuse to leave a relationship because of the spiritual side of it. It's not just the physical side. It's not just the emotional side. It's the spiritual side that's going on in the second heaven. So you best believe that God takes relationships and what we do with our bodies very, very seriously and whom with, okay? Anyway, let, let me start from Matthew 19, 8 again. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries an old woman commits adultery. OK, the disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. I certainly wasn't. <laughs> others were made that way by men and others have renounced the marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, some people, they are in a small minority, but some people have completely devoted their lives to God. And of course, those kinds of people do get attacked spiritually by Satan. So uh, pray for those people. For goodness sake, all those people who are lifelong virgins, who want to stay devoted to God. They, they, in other words, they've devoted their lives to God. They've, they've forsaken relationships and everything. OK, pray for them because they, those sort of people come under heavy 
spiritual attack. Okay, and I'm not I'm not fooling around here. They get tempted with all kinds of sexual immorality and all sorts of things. Anyway, um, the one who can accept this should accept it. So God sees that as being admirable if we can devote our lives to him. Okay. Now we're on to Matthew 19, 13, the little children and Jesus. Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. In other words, the disciples told the people off who brought the children in. Okay. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Now we're on to Matthew 19, 16, the rich young man. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honour your father and mother and love your neighbour as yourself. Okay, All these I kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell all your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Money is a root of all kinds of different evil on this earth. Okay, Greed and materialism, it all belongs to this world and all the treasures of this world, all the material possessions, all the money is destined to perish. Okay, So do not put your trust and faith in money, in property, in cars, in anything. Okay, <laughs> Just put your trust in him. This life is so, so short. Don't make the mistake of being a materialistic and greedy fool, okay? Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, he's saying it's hard for rich and well-off people to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Then the disciples heard, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So that means many rich people are going to be saved. Many, many wealthy people will be saved, but not all of them, unfortunately. Jesus looked at them and said, with, yeah, 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 okay, I've read that already. Then it says here, Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Don't forget that Jesus' disciples live from hand to mouth, okay? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, can you imagine that in the future? <laughs> And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Now, can you imagine it? So he's encouraging people to more or less forget about this short life. This short life is just a little training ground. That's what it is. OK, it's all leading up to what's going to be for or is it in the future if we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. OK. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. So in other words, many people who accept Jesus as, as their Lord and Saviour at a young age will be last. In other words, they'll fail, they'll make mistakes, they'll sin, and end up coming last place. And a lot of people who end up believing in Jesus, let's say towards the end of their lives, or at some other point at a later date than other people, will end up being first. So... But this world is literally full of millions of atheists, it's millions of unbelievers, it's full of millions of Satanists, Buddhists, Muslims, you name it, uh, Hindus, <laughs> who are going to end up being saved, and those people are going, to end up, are going to end up becoming first. And a lot of people who were already Christians from the start 
because of various sins they committed, they'll they'll be last, but they'll still be saved. Don't forget, a lot of people are going to be saved as if through fire. It's not going to be easy, but he's going to pull them through somehow, okay? Remember, God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at outward appearances. This world looks at outward appearances. This world looks at what car you drive, how you dress, what sort of job you've got, how much money you earn, what qualifications you have, what sort of holidays you've been on, how many people you've slept with, how good looking your partner is. God doesn't look at anything like that. He looks at the heart of the person. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I hope very, very much that you've enjoyed the video. I hope I haven't made it too long. If there's any parts of this video that you haven't understood properly, then by all means, go back in the video and watch those parts again and listen to them over and over again until you've got it into your head. Okay, so, yeah. Now, I'm nearly at the end of Matthew. I've got about one, two, three... Ooh, I say nearly at the end. Four, five, six... <laughs> I've got quite a bit to go. Yeah, it just goes on and on and on. Matthew is a large part of the Bible. I've got up about 10 or so pages to go anyway. Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to like and subscribe. I thank you so, so much for tuning in. It means a lot to me, okay? And I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye and take care.